Thank you, thank you very much for the for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be to be present in at five universities at the same time in Italy. Yeah, thanks thanks a lot. So this is going to be a joint work with uh, with one of my students. Uh, I'm sorry, Mate Palfi. Yeah, and it's going to be uh, about uh, universally bare sets. So. Why, why are we interested in uh, universally bare sets? Let me give you some motivation first. Uh, the first one is simply that uh, we already have universally measurable sets. That's a very nice theory. So what, what is it about? It's, it's, it's not interesting and I'm actually going to be using it. So we had Lebeg, Lebeg measurable set. And then that can, gener that can be generalized to universally measurable sets. Actually, a set is universally measurable if it is measurable with respect to the completion of every probability Borel measure. But this is just the motivation, so we, we are not going to be using it. And dually, we have the bare property, which from now on I'm going to be abbreviating it as bare property and here we have a huge question mark what should be the dual so i think this is already a strong enough motivation in many situations universally measure universal measurability is much more natural on, a, on, a, on a, just on a polish space polish space is a complete separable metric space just on a polish space there is no lebeck measure there is no natural notion of what, what is what, what is a lebeck measurable set and universal measurable sets play this role perfectly uh, many many applications so i think it's it's a perfectly legit question to ask uh, how about how about the, the bare category dual second second motivation uh, Somehow, if you define it appropriately, and that's what, ha what actually happened. This was done by Feng Magidor. No, the, yes, Feng Magidor, that's the correct order. Magidor and Woodin. They did define a certain, certain notion of, of, of universal measurability. Okay, this is going to be quite abstract, quite abstract set theory. If you don't understand some of these terms, don't worry. I'm, 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 this is just side remark in a sense, motivation. Uh, this just says that an, an appropriate notion of, of universal bareness, which we are going to talk about. If you define it appropriately, then that is very, very closely connected to some interesting and deep set theoretical, set theoretical phenomena, which is, what, what is it? This is called the generic absoluteness. What is generic absoluteness? Generic absoluteness says that certain type of results are absolute for forcing. You cannot change that by, by doing some sort of forcing. So it's con the continuum hypo hypothesis you can change by forcing. Maybe it's false, you do a forcing, it becomes true, or the other way around. Continuum hypothesis is not generically absolute, uh, uh, and certain type of results are. It's, it's the Schoenfield absoluteness theorem that sigma one two doesn't matter what they are if you don't know don't worry this is just as i said just a side remark sigma one two statements are 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 are, are generically absolute this is the schoenfield absoluteness result if a statement has a very nice form this sigma one two some something is logic it has a very nice form you cannot change the validity of the statement using forcing it generically re re refers to by forcing if you do forcing it's a generic extension and sigma one three sets are generically absolute generically absolute if and only if this is this is a, this is one of the main results of Feng and Magidor and Woodin. If and only if all delta, uh, I'm sorry, delta one, two sets. If you know what it is, then it's interesting for you. If you don't, don't worry. This is just just a remark. Sets are universally bare, which is not yet defined. I know, but 
This is, an, this is another motivation. The, actually, this was the motivation why Frank Monty Durand would uh, introduce introduced this uh, introduce this uh, this whole stuff. Okay, but this is all simply just to say that it's it, it, it's a good idea to try to study universally bare sets, and uh, and and uh, this is this is this is what happened. Okay, so this is what happened. Here is the history. So this paper of Frank Mogidor and Woodin appeared in '92, and I think for a long while people thought that this was the very, the very first time then that the universally bare sets were introduced. But it turned out that much earlier. Oh, I should I should I should fix some fix some notation for the definitions. So X will always be just a Polish space. Complete separable metric space, and A will just be an arbitrary subset, subset of X. That, that's fixed there. Okay. So the, the first definition was not by Frank Magider and Wooden, even though many people saw that, that that was the first one. But much, much earlier, Chris Tenzen in 1974 uh, introduced introduced the following following notation. Let's say that A is universally bare. Yeah, UB will be the shorthand for universally bare from now on. If and only if the following thing happens. So for every uh, compact house door, Is y, and for every continuous function from y into x, we have that the preimage of A as the bare property. Okay, so we say that it is universally bare should mean that every continuous preimage has the bare property, but it's very important. And I, 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 I'm missing, missing, an, missing an, something important here. I, I didn't say, I said, I think I said continuous because it is equivalent, but at formally, so Christian then said, well, I will come back to this later. Continuous, so after every function, which is from Y to X, Borel, the pre-image has the bare property. Sorry, I'm confusing it, but somehow this is the point. As you will see in a second, people kept just confusing these. All sorts of definitions around. So the, 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 the talk will not just about this. Okay, here's a definition, what do we know? But the first part of the talk will show that, okay, here are a dozen definitions and it's it's a chaos. And so what then? So this this is, this is what, uh, what, what, the, what the case is. So let me, let me say what, for example, the FANG, Magidor wooden definition said in ninety two. They said that A is U B if and only if for every topological space, no compact, no house doors. And for every Continuous function. We have that the preimage of A has the bare property. Okay. But when when, I, when we wanted to apply this universal universal bareness for something, we came across all these definitions and we had no idea. Okay, are they are they equivalent? And then it turned out. Okay, so far so good. They are. They are equivalent. Okay, this is not, not, not yet a big deal. Then we look for some more some more info. Fremlin. Fremlin did something else. A is U B if and only if for every check complete space. The continuous preimage. Has the property of bear. And then it turns, okay, still equivalent. Still not a good topic for the talk. 
because this is still equivalent. But then, Boudin himself, in another paper, said the exact same thing, but here then check complete, this check complete. Martin? Yes. Martin, sir, uh, uh, what does it check complete mean? Could you remind yeah. us? Uh, so the point is we're not going to need it and we don't, don't don't care for the purposes of the talk but it's just that uh, a, a topological space is check complete if it is homeomorphic to a g delta subset of a compact hausdorff space so it's a quite specific quite a specific uh, class of topological spaces we are not going to use it okay. but 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 uh, I, I just I just want to highlight that there are so many weird definitions here. Some of them equivalent, some of them unequivalent, and so on and so on. So what did Boudin say? He did, said, did the exact same, but he replaced the check complete. Okay, sorry. Let me not write this down. I think it's time for a general for a general definition. Let F be a class of topological spaces. Then we say that A is F universally bare. Universally bare using this class of topological spaces, if and only if every continuous. I, we don't we don't use Borel because Borel is much not, not that frequent. And it turns out that Borel and continuous are okay, almost equivalent. But okay, let me come back to this later. A is F U B if for every Y in F and every continuous function from y to x we have that the pre-image has the bare property in y okay this is fub so so far what did we have okay christensen was a bit different because not of this form because of this weird boreal thing but it is actually equivalent to the feng magidor wooden which is the class of all topological spaces and then Fremley used check complete spaces, and then Woodin used, so definition, Woodin himself, in another paper, used, used uh, compact UB, or the compact spaces. Okay, and then this is non equivalent, at least consistently. So the, this is the first time when it turns out that this is just not the same. I will come back to this later. Then Yablonska defines, Yablonska used compact metric UB. So all the continuous bit pre is in compact metric spaces. Then Materon, uh, and the list is endless, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna, going to stop here. Zeleny, they used Polish. They use Polish universal bear, which means that I, I think I think you get the point. And and these are all non-equivalent, at least consistently. Even with each other. So we had to backtrack. We had an application in mind. At, at the end of the talk, if I have time, I will talk about this specific application. We wanted to apply universally bear sets, but we had to backtrack. I mean it's hopeless, hopeless to use them, right? All the all these definitions are non-equivalent. Um, you cannot cite results because one of the one of the results uses this definition, the other one uses that, so you get very easily get all sorts of mistakes. It just doesn't work out. And uh, so the main result, the main result is that we classified all these definitions into the following diagram. So this is our main theorem. It's a summarized in a diagram. Here we have topological universally bare, which implies Polish universally bare, and also compact universally bare, which both imply compact metric universally bare okay actually these implications are trivial because if you have like compact for example like compact universally bare why is it implied by topological universally bare? if if a if class of class of uh, 
class of topological spaces he uses is bigger than of course the, the the notion is stronger so so these 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 four arrows are actually just obvious by the containment between the classes of topological spaces but the, the result the result is that that this is the result all all known definitions so we checked and this was very cumbersome and many non, highly non-trivial non-trivial uh, equivalence and non-equivalences all known definitions are equivalent to one of these First, first thing that's important, and the other thing that that's important is that these four are pairwise non-equivalent. Unfortunately, we can only do this under the continuum hypothesis. Under the continuum hypothesis, I, I will come back to this later. Whether that's whether that's necessary or, not, or unnecessary. Okay, so this is the landscape. This is the landscape, and once you have this, then you, you, you see the clear picture. You can apply apply the result, and so so the talk is going to be about these these four classes. I mean, what advantages? These are these advantages. Which one to use? Which is suitable most suitable for set theory? Which is most suitable for Descriptive set theory and 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 things like that. So let me say a few Excuse words. Me, about... Martin, Martin. Sorry. When you say that they are not pairwise non-equivalent, you mean that also the sort of there are two completely incomparable uh, classes, right? The Polish and the compact. There is uh, no implication yeah. whatsoever between them. Yeah, that's also true. That's also true. No, no, no more implications here. Yeah, under CH, no, no, no more implications than than what's in the. No more implications. Okay. Exactly. Good. Exactly. Under CH, no more implications. Exactly. Okay. So let me say a few words about all these classes. I have uh, while we're at, I have a question. Um, is 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 there a, is there a, I mean. Is it true that they're all equivalent under AD or something like this? Because every 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 set are uh, UV, or I mean, is it not absolutely not the case? Or is there a model in which they are all equivalent? So somehow? I I I never never drop the axiom of choice. So I think ah, a good ah, question. Ah. Whether under AD uh, they are, I think they are because I think it's true that under AD every Reset is even topologically universally there. This is this is I vaguely remember this. So yeah, okay. okay I'm not an expert yeah. in AD, so I'm a bit bit hesitant to say this, but I think so. I think this is true that even the strongest notion holds for every okay. set under AD. So okay. under AD, they are all equivalent. Yeah. Uh, okay, actually, thanks. I do not know for model of ZFC where they are all equivalent. I I know only of one one error that can be reversed in 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 one model. I'm going to I'm going to do be, be I, I'm I'm going to come back to this later. But but the other okay. for the other for the other arrows whether they can be reversed consistently, that's that's just open. I, I can only reverse an error. Okay, maybe I should I should rush ahead and say that uh, that. Uh, when you say compact, uh, you say compact or compact also. Actually, it doesn't matter. I, I I could put here. I just don't want there. There's just so many. There is fifty definitions in our paper. Literally fifty. I just you can you could put here compact Hausdorff. I just didn't want to bother with all these, all the definitions. That's equivalent to compact. These are non-trivial, highly non-trivial, highly non-trivial questions, but that's actually equivalent. Okay. If if it was you, Matteo, it's good to see you. Hi. <laughs> okay. So let me see a few words about all these, uh, all these, um, all these definitions. First, I regret to say that two of these are not very good. So here is a warning. Compact. Compact UB and the same with compact uh, metric UB, they just do not imply the pair property. So we just don't like them. I at least I I, I don't like them. And the and the and the and the example is very simple. Let L uh, be in the bare space Q. 
let, let it be just a losing set. Okay, they, they exist under CH. For example, under CH, many more models. Uh, what is a losing set? A losing set is a set that is countable in every uh, every meager set. Uh, the set itself is uncountable. We actually even know that it is it is non meager. So the losing set is automatically non meager, but in every meager set it's countable. So in particular, in every compact set, it is countable, right? So the losing set is okay. We want to show that it is compact. Uh, universe. Martha, I've I've actually lost your your screen. I don't know if the others have lost your oh. screen as well, but now I see it all black. Oh really? How about the others? We see for, it. for us, it's okay. We can it's see okay. the screen oh. very well. Now, now, now it's fine. Now it's fine. Okay. So let's let's suppose that we have a we have a map F from a compact space into the bare space. Then the image image F of Y is compact. So the losing set hits it in just countably many points. So the pre-image, the F inverse of L is always an F sigma set. The, uni the, the countable, I mean, it's very easy that. Moreover, but, but, but we know, so this is, this is compact UB and compact matrix UB, but, it's, uh, but it doesn't even have the bare property because a losing set is known to not have the bare property. So, so it's a very simple example saying that 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 uh, these these two definitions are not very suitable for 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 us to for being a nice generalization of of bare properties as being universe bare should imply bare. So I'm, I, I I I I would draw these two definitions out. They're interesting and we examine the the connections, but but if you want to apply it, then that these two are not the ones not the ones to look for. Okay, let me say a few words. What what do we know about about uh, top UB? topological spaces so the fang the fang fang magidor definitions let me just say a few interesting interesting uh, equivalences let me just give a few equivalences it's for example i think it's a nice statement that this all topological spaces is equivalent to all metric spaces i think this is a bit surprising it's highly non-trivial and it actually is, is easily follows from the, the okay this is fang magidor voting i should should say this is fang magidor voting so it just follows from the fact that this is also equivalent to being UB cardinal for all infinite cardinals. This is a class of topological spaces, lambda to the omega. Okay, lambda is not with the order topology, lambda is discrete. Lambda, it's a, a lambda is a discrete space of size lambda. You look at the omega's power. This is a metric space. If you only consider these these uh, these topological spaces, and you look at the pre-images in these ones, this is equivalent to the topological universe of bareness. And uh, and I should also mention mention that this has a this was actually this was this is sort of the punchlines when you when you look at the set theoretical applications. But if you don't okay, if don't if you don't understand the next definition, don't worry. That's not that's not very essential. So it's also equivalent to that the, the, the set has a certain tree representation, like analytic, analytic sets, if you know what they mean. Analytic sets have three representations and somehow universal bareness is also equivalent to a very special kind of tree representation. It is as follows. So for every forcing notion, T, if you don't know forcing, it's not a problem. I will, I will stop this part in a second. Uh, there exist trees, T and T prime. Oh, this definition only works in the bare space, but I, I will be a bit vague, don't worry. Such that, such that the projection of T equals A, the projection of T prime equals the complement of A. Moreover, and, and this, this, ha this is true even after forcing. So sort of there are, there are some tree representations like for the analytic sets which are which are which which are not destroyed by the forcing. There is some ambig okay, I, I don't want to go into more detail. So somehow this is why this is why this is why in set theory this this plays this plays uh, a very important role. Okay, uh, let me say a few words. I'm, I'm not yet uh, talking about the preference between the two. Let me say a few words about Polish universally bare. 
what do we know? What do we know about the Polish universe repair? Actually, this result, this result is quite recent. Yeah, I should have mentioned, okay, doesn't matter. Let, let me just write this down. So the following are, following are equivalent. One, A is Polish universal repair. Two, A is second countable. Second countable universally there. Three, it's quite interesting. So for every Y, which is Polish, and for every F, from y to x so far this looks exactly as the definition but this is a borel isomorphism we have that the free image has the tag so why do we like this because i forgot to mention that red swap this is red swap that this definition of universal fairness. I didn't say this because it was not of the form because they are not continuous pre-images, but, but we have bijections. Let me give a few more interesting, interesting ones. So for every finer Polish topology, say tau prime on X, uh, we have that our set has the bare property with respect this final Polish topology. I think this is also an interesting one. Uh, and let me let me give one more, which is very weird, but 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 I will explain in a moment. For every sigma ideal I, which is a subset of the Borel subsets of X, with the factor isomorphic to the category algebra, I, 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 I will say in a minute what it is. We have the following, A, okay. There exists a Borel set. And there exists a set which is small, such that the Borel set is a subset of A, which is a subset of B union I. Okay? Okay, this is a bit weird. So what's my point here? My point here that this has, this, this Polish universally bear has many, 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 many equivalent definitions, which are all um, natural from certain viewpoints. Like 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 four for example. That that in descriptive set theory, I think this is a very natural definition. It doesn't look equivalent at first sight. So I think it's interesting that these are all, all equivalent, and uh, and they're quite quite different, and and they are all equivalent. And so what I would like to say is that that uh, these proofs are very not trivial. I mean, this we only could do this recently. And what's the reason? Uh, the reason is that. For example, that uh, that Polish and second countable are equivalent, or that 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 Polish and Borel isomorphisms are equivalent. Not clear at all. I, I know of no direct proof. Uh, the only proof I know are via five. So five is five is the is the most important one. Oh, I should have said. I should have said. So this idea, the idea from from a paper. This all still the main idea from Piotr Zakrzewski. So it's, it's, that was definitely his, his key idea that it is very hard to, to prove all these equivalences. And the punchline is that we have this five, which is, which is very strange. Yeah, I, I promised I, I give you the category, the category algebra. The, the category algebra is, what is it? It's the Borel, Borel algebra of R, uh, modulo the Borel algebra of, I mean, the, the meager sets, 
the meager subs M M M M R is the meager subset so far, which is the I, I could have also said the unique uh, Boolean algebra that is uh, that is separable, atomless, and complete. I could have also uh, said that. Okay, and so so this is just um, just sort of sort of the, the 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 proof idea of this whole theorem, which is very strange that to get equivalences is hopeless. Is, at least for us, it was for a long time. And the punchline was that using this this weird number five in the Boolean algebras and and Sikorsky Sikorsky I'm, I, I'm sorry I'm, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right I think it's Sikorsky's theorem is the key key here which says that if you have two Borel two Boolean algebras of this form Borel modulo i Borel modulo j if the algebras are equivalent the category algebra is one here the Borel mod i is the other one if the if the two Boolean algebras are the same. And you can find the Borel isomorphism between the underlying spaces, which realizes this isomorphism. This is the Sikorsky theorem. And this idea, this idea is used in in in, in, in all these uh, all these things. So uh, time is running really fast. So let me just okay. So sort of this is the this is the description of most of the main ideas of this diagram. There are some refinements. But for the refinements, I will just, I, I don't really have time. I will just give you two sentences. So instead of, instead of F, Y, X continuous, how about Borel? And the moral of the story is that, uh, that compactness plays no role anymore. If you have continuous functions, then compactness is of course very essential. But if you have if you have um, if you have Borel functions, then compactness compactness can be dropped. So everything is still the same, except we have what? So far we had topological, here we had Polish, here we had compact, here we had compact metric. And now we will have just these two classes. This will be equivalent. This will be equivalent, and we still have the 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 implication in between. And if they have that under CH, it cannot be reversed. So this is what happens if you work with Borel Borel preimages instead of continuous preimages. And the other small remark is that uh, Budin actually, I I yeah, I should be more fair. Uh, fairer. Budin actually he didn't make a mistake. So when he when in another paper he only used compact pre-images he was he was actually working in a compact space throughout that paper and once we are inside a compact space he was right he was consistent i mean because his name showed up in two of the definitions and they were inequivalent which is not nice and uh, i shouldn't blame him for, for for that at all because in the other paper he was working in a compact space and this is this is true so if, if x is compact but it's but it is enough if, if it is sigma compact then we have the same picture. We have the exact same picture. So if you are interested in subsets of the Rn or subsets of the Cantor space and not the bare space, then then you just have these two classes. Still, the the diagram is collapsed into uh, into two. The, the two classes are the same. You would obtain with continuous function and with topological or polish. Uh, sorry, I'm to say it again. The two class. So here you are collapsing classes, right? Yes. But so what's the relation between this with Borel maps and the ones you add with continuous maps? Uh, so if, if you have, if you add either sigma compactness or Borelness of the map of F or both, all, the, all these cases, you get the two classes only. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. So my question is, is Polish with respect to Borel functions the same as Polish with respect to continuous functions, for example? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. 
Oh, oh yeah, yeah, you're, you're right. That's a, that's a further question. You are right. It is absolutely. So I had a list saying that all, all these versions are equivalent with for topological, and and then and the different list. All these versions are equivalent for for Polish, and if you add Borel there, then these equivalences are still there. Maybe now, how I'm hoping now I, I I'm answering your question, right? Yes, thanks. Okay. So for Poli Polish with Borel and Polish with continuous, for example, this is, this is one, one instance, they are equivalent. Yes. Okay. So what next? Uh, now I, we only have, have the, two, the two, two, two good candidates, this Polish and topological. And I want to argue that, okay, I think it's quite, quite clear that for these set theory applications, Topological is the right one, but now I want to argue that for descriptive set theory, Polish UB is the nice one. So, which is the right dual to unif measurable? And let me argue, let me argue that it is Polish. Let me argue that it is it is it is the Polish universal polymer. So, I already gave you one definition. It's very easy to check that this is equivalent. That 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 a subset of a Polish space is universally measurable. If you don't know what it is, don't don't, 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 don't worry. If and only if for every f zero one to, to x Borel isomorphism. F inverse of A is Lebeck measurable. You could also take this as a definition of universal measurability. And here is the theorem. A subset of X is Polish. Universally bare. If and only if for every Borel isomorphism between the unit interval and X, And the pre image is uh, has the bare property. I think this is very, very word by word analog. So showing that that this is the this is the right uh, the right uh, right dual form. Moreover, moreover, somehow if you look at the results, so the, I mean the theories of these two notions, what 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 you can get. Somehow, topological universally bare is extremely so strong. It's, it's way too strong. So, top UB is very strong. Let me just give you one example. Uh, top UB implies universally measurable. And this looks a bit strange, right? I mean, no version of bare bare properties should imply measurability. This 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 should be like orthogonal or something, um, and that is consistently this is this is not the case. For example, under CH does not imply uh, imply yeah, I mean I mean the same thing. So this should be this should be orthogonal. So what you can get for for universally measurable, you can prove for universally Polish universally bare and vice versa, but the theory of top un, topologically universally bare has no nice analog for for universally measurable sets. It is much much stronger, and and the things you can get for them, you, you cannot get for uh, for, uh, for 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 universal universally measurable sets. Okay. Any questions so far? Because now, uh, yeah, it was it was a lot. I I understand, but I think uh, I've summarized essentially all the knowledge we have about these various definitions of universal bareness. And now I'm going to move on to first the set theoret theoretical aspects. So the role of th, whether we need, we need the continuum hypothesis or not, and then I will move forward to this uh, this application that motivated us. But so so far. This is this is the picture. This is the picture of the definitions. What we know: equivalences, non-equivalences, and and so on. So, are there any more questions? Okay, this is not the case. 
let me let me move to the role of ch so i think it would be best to have zfc examples it would be nice to, to prove that just you know set theoretical assumptions the notions are no no notions uh, are, are non-equivalent we cannot do that yeah uh, here is here, we, uh, okay uh, we can reverse one arrow consistently but only one as i, I have already mentioned so it is consistent that Polish universally bear is the same as compact metric. This was the this was if, if we had this diagram here here we can we could here we could reverse reverse uh, just one application one 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 uh, implication. So there is there is one equivalence. So we cannot hope for ZFC examples. Let me say a few words about this because I think the 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 the, the intermediate result we proved in order to get this is very interesting in its in its own right. So how how to get this? How to get this? Let me call this uh, this phenomenon reflection of non non bare property in Cantor set. What do I mean? a few sentences about this. I think it's quite self-explanatory. Uh, the question is, suppose you have a set that does not have the bare property, can you then find a Cantor set such that the trace of the set does not have the bare property inside with respect to this Cantor set? This is the question. And it turns out that this is an independent, the answer is that this is independent. And it also turns out that when it actually holds, this reflection phenomenon actually holds, then we can get the consistency. So, um, yeah, let me let me just write this down, uh, write this down in a more more carefully. Uh, theorem: the following statement is consistent. So, whenever Y is a Polish space, A is a. Let, let me call it Y and B because this is a, this is going to play the role of the preimage of A. So, B subset B subset of Y. And we know the following, uh, for every Cantor set C in our Polish space, A intersect C has the bare property relative to C. Let's assume all this, okay? B intersection C, not oh, A. Oh, thank you very much, that I changed it to B. Thanks. Then, then B has the bare property in the whole space. So this is, uh, yeah, this is the sort of the, the ref I mean, this is the reflection of non-bare property. So if it's a, if any Cantor set, it has the bare property relative to the Cantor set, then it has the has the bare property. Actually, I could add it's a bit stronger result instead of Cantor sets. You could put here no verdense Cantor sets, which is a huge difference if you work in a not zero. I mean, if you work in the Cantor set itself, then my 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 result is is is, is meaningless. But it doesn't matter. It's it's good enough for us. And uh, you could put there no verdense Cantor set, but it's. I think this is interesting enough, and, uh, and that that's that's much more technical. I'm not going into the proof because the proof is uh, it so it holds a Miller model. Forcing, it's a technical forcing construction. But 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 it's it's Miller forcing, just Miller forcing, the usual Miller model. But but I but I but I don't know how to how to derive this from 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 properties of the Miller model or cardinal invariance or whatever. So you really have to have to dig deep and do 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 do, do the actual Miller forcing, and this is a, this is I, I guess by far the hardest hardest proof in the. In, in the paper, I think this is quite interesting in its in its own right, and it sort of connects to some some previous results. So so the reflection of non meagerness already existed, reflection of analysis and conalysity and borealness. I mean, there are very nice very nice results of this sort already in the on, in the literature. Um, yeah, typically uh, somehow I mean not in this model. So this is this is I guess this is really something new. And so as a corollary, so let, let me let me just give you the proof that once you have reflection, then you get then you get that the two two notions two notions are, are equivalent. So proof 
using reflection what am i proving now using reflection we prove that that uh, that if we have compact metric ub why does it imply polish ub here we apply reflection this is going to be a very very easy proof now yes uh, we have to uh, so how do we do that uh, we have to show that our we have to show that our set a we have to show that it is polish universally bare assuming it is compact metric universally bare what is the definition take a polish space and take a map it goes from the Polish space into X, where, where A is sitting. Question is, A is sitting here. Question is, is the pre-image a bare set? It doesn't have the bare property. What do we do? Look at this F of A, F inverse of A, which is a subset of Y. This plays the role of, of Y and B in this, in this reflection. So, in order to get that f inverse of a has the bare property, it suffices now to show that f inverse of a is a bare property stability set relative to every Cantor set. So fix a Cantor subset of y, and now we ask ourselves, so is f inverse relatively a BP set inside of C? But our assumption is that, I mean, this is almost trivial. Our assumption is that in the compact metric spaces, the pre images of Y have the bare property. But what is the compact metric space? Uh, F of C is a compact, is a compact, it is sitting inside of Y, but maybe we don't care. It's a compact metric space. And did I did I mean f of c? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I just mean as actually c itself. Ah, sorry to for my singing. C itself is a compact metric space, and f restricted to c is your continuous map on your compact metric space. So by the assumption inside of c, you have that it has a bare property relative to c, and this is exactly exactly what you, what you what you what you have to check. So, so after you have the reflection, uh, which is the difficult part, uh, this is this is this is this is just just trivial. Okay, so uh, Raphael, how how much time do I still have? I think you have uh, about ten minutes. How about ten minutes? Uh, but you can you can also take. I think you can take. Uh, if you, um, you can take fifteen minutes. If you I, I think I think I I can I think I can manage with time. Perfect, perfect. Well, thank you. Okay, so let me say a few words about your our original our original our original motivation. So why did we need these these universally the universally bare sets? So lately I've been I've been very interested in, interested in a special kind of small set uh, in a in a Polish in a Polish group uh, definition. This is Hunt, Zauer, and Bjork. Actually, in the same year as Frank Magidor Wood, 1993. This will be a deja vu. In the exact same year, they came up with a very nice definition. Let me give you the first side, but I will explain why, why it's not true at all. So let G be, now we not only have a Polish space, but let G be a Polish group. There are many, many interesting Polish groups. Think of like Banach spaces, if you like Banach spaces, or or C01 with addition, if you like continuous functions, or S infinity, or or, or whatever. So Polish groups abound, and they, and they are very nice and useful. But on the Polish groups, there is no nice measure. There is no hard measure, for example. On the locally compact ones, there is, but on the general Polish groups, uh, you, you do not have a hard measure. However, however, you can say that and the A subset of G. You can say that A is R now, no harm measure, remember, no harm measure. 
if the following happens, if there exists Borel set covering A, and there exists a measure, no behind measure, not an invariant measure, just some measure, mu a Borel probability measure. such that all the translates of your set are new now. So for every G and K, C, 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 A. In non-commutative groups, you have to apply two-sided translations. This is all now. I mean, if you, if you say, okay, what, what is this? Uh, I understand, that's perfectly understandable. So the justification for this definition is because this mu is not a not a natural measure. The mu depends on a, so this is very artificial. But the justification is that if G happens to be locally compact, then then something is hard now if and only if uh, it has measure zero with respect to the R measure. So this is a perfectly nice generalization of being measure zero with respect to R null. But this this definition works in the non-locally compact case as well. You know, these, well, all the Polish groups, not only, not, not in the, uh, not in the, not in the nice ones. Okay, this was 92, and this is the digital of the part. Uh, the theory started to develop. It has many, many very nice applications in Banach spaces, differentiation. I mean, functions are differentiable almost everywhere with respect to this notion. Automatic continuity results. If you don't know what it is, that's a very nice topic. And and these Harnell sets have many many applications. But then it turned out much earlier, Christensen again. Actually, he he he's a party spoiler because he's off by two years. This was seventy two, I guess. Oh, and I have to check. I don't know. Yeah, it's seventy two. So it's not 74 like before. So he already gave this definition. And again, it was forgotten. And everyone thought for a long, long time that Hans and Mariot were the first one. Where, whereas in, in, in reality, Christensen had defined it much earlier. So he, he said almost the same thing. He said almost the same thing. Let me not write this down again. There was just one tiny difference in his definition, which is almost the same. He put there universally measurable. So he, much earlier, he came up with the definition. Actually, it's very, very, the story is weird. The paper is in the Israel Journal of Mathematics. So the paper is in English. I mean, it should be, it was accessible at the time for everyone. Still, this was forgotten for 20 years, no, no reaction. Uh, and, uh, and then when it was rediscovered, then the theory started blossoming. Okay, but once again, we are in a similar situation. We have two definitions. Uh, we don't, do not know if they are equivalent or not. Actually, this was a, an open question for quite a, quite a while. And uh, am I confused? And so, so they are not, not equivalent, not equivalent in ZFC. Uh, actually, this is something I proved with um, with Zoltan Vidnyansky. Yeah, I should, I, should, I should put his name here. So this was me and Zoltan Vidnyansky. Uh, they, are, they are not equivalent. So, so uh, I think it would be better to say that the first definition, first definition should be, so the Hans Sauer York, that should be called like Harnal. And the Chris Tenzan Zen's definition should be called the generalized harm, right? It's a bit more general. Okay, and the story story continued. Again, once you have a nice definition, you are interested in the duals. You are interested in the duals, but who where are the duals? No dual. The first step was by Darucci. Who came up with a very nice definition. Came up with a nice definition. Again, G is a Polish group. A is a subset of G. It is called Harnal. No, I'm sorry, Harmedia. 
If the following thing happens, if there exists a Borel set covering A, and instead of the instead of this the, the, the weird non non invariant measure, the test measure, now we have a compact metric metric space. And we have a continuous function such that for every translate we have that G B H is meager in K. Okay, sort of this is the analog. It's it was not clear, and there was there were some false att failed attempts to to, to 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 define the duals. They never worked. And and sort of this is the right duo. This is the right duo that worked very very nicely. And and hey, Mark, where is Sorry. that? Where is yeah. that? Same question. Yeah. <laughs> it again, I, I made a mistake, right? F inverse of this. Ah, okay. Pre image. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. The pre image of this. This is this is the right 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 right, right analog of. Uh, let me not explain why this is the right. This F inverse. Is the right analog of of this of this test measure? This is this test function is now the the right analog to test measure. Okay, and um, and I wanted to understand uh, how 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 you do the how do you do the generalized Harmeager notion? Generalized Harmeager, and for that, of course, you need to replace Borel by universally bare. That's the right dual. But this is where I got stuck because I just checked the literature and I found that okay, this is a this is a chaos, this is a mess, and, and we and we have to find have to, have to and now we have the right definition. Now we have this right definition, the the the, the pole. So Borel now Borel now you can replace by Polish universally bare, and in the upcoming paper we will we will show that the theory works. The theory works well. So whatever you could do with the with the generalized ones, uh, uh, you could uh, even generalize harm now. You can do with the with the generalized harm. This is completely parallel. Everything is nice and polished. Uh, sorry for the pun. And let me just conclude with uh, in just one moment. Sorry, with with some open problems. In case you do not have questions concerning this application part. Okay, so let me just conclude with the open problems. I think the, the most important ones are the test theoretic ones, whether we have ZFC examples. I mean, I mean, um, I mean, is that no CH assumed? So if we have four classes and the non equivalences, can we do? ZFC examples. So, do we have to do like four things every single time to show show that they are actually equivalent? Uh, and the other question I like very interesting is that. So, what is the dual? I, I have some ideas. I think it would be interesting to find this find this class. So, topological universally bare is much stronger than just Polish universally bare. For every topological space, you have this. So instead of measurable for every Borel, every finite Borel measure, you should you should say that that it is if if you have an arbitrary measure space, you have a measurable map into your space. The pre image is measurable there, or something like this. And I'm guessing you get an interesting class here. I think it would be very very nice to get such a dual theory. A test question could be whether the dual one implies universal bareness. Polish universal fairness. That would be a very, I mean, because we, I said that this topological universal fairness has this weird extra property that it implies universal measurability. I think if you come up here with the right definition, then this, 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 this uh, dual version should imply um, universal fairness. I think it would be very interesting. And, uh, and, the, and the last question is whether, whether Polish universally bear 
has this strange property it should not have. Uh, here we have, here you know, that no under CH. So the question is whether this is, this is a non-implication in, in Z of C. Um, here I, I, I again have to, yeah, I, sh I could add that. What is the Zanon problem? It might happen sometimes the, the symmetry breaks. Even though it's the zero left Zanon problem, a difficult problem. This is not so difficult. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, thanks a lot, Martin. Uh, let's all thank Martin. And um, it was a very nice talk. Uh, I'm very sorry my, my connection went off for five minutes in the middle just when you proved something. So I, I, I missed your proof. But, uh, but it, it, it was a very nice talk. It's, uh, I find it very nice that uh, finally someone took the task of like uh, going through all the definitions of universal fairness and uh, check everything and just like clean everything up. This is super, super nice. So thanks a lot. Um, all right, is there, are there questions for Martin? Well, Martin, can you go back to Dash's definition, uh, please? So what about if you if you extend where you rather than looking just at compact metric spaces, you look at more spaces? I mean, that's a little bit in the spirit of what you are doing, right? Uh, you are right. Uh, uh, I have no idea. Um, so if you if you look pre pre images in all sorts of spaces instead of I know that somehow I mean poly spaces would be the first one to come to mind. I, I it somehow it makes no sense. It trivializes. Uh, okay, maybe it's not interesting because it's equivalent to meagerness or something. Okay, but I. Uh, I do not know the at the top at the moment. Yeah, I think I think that's the case, and it should be very easy. Yeah. So, okay. so for some for some reason, these variations are not very good. So, so there we really need to keep compact there. Yes. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, do we have more questions for Martin? I see that Matteo is. Uh... Can, can you uh, elaborate more on what you mean the dual of um, universally bare, topologically universally bare? Uh, I, I'm not very specific because I don't really know, but something like something, I don't have a, a specific definition because otherwise I would have stated it. So, uh, universal measurable means that it is measurable with respect to a class of measures. And, and and so that this dual should be that it is measurable with respect to a much huger class of measures, because this class of measures we are looking at are like sort of the, 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 the Polish university, but it's just the Polish spaces, just the nice measures. Okay, so one, one definition, for example, is that something is universally measurable if and only if, if you take the, the Borel isomorphic images in, in in uh, poly spaces, then they are they are measurable, universally measure, measurable with respect to. You fix a measure on a poly space, fix a Borel isomorphism, then it's measurable with respect to this measure. But here, the measure has to be a nice Borel measure on a nice poly space. Expe I mean, replace this with all topological spaces, all Borel measures on these general topological spaces, or maybe even more general, just some all measures on all measurable spaces, and then the Either the pre images or the isom Borel isomorphic images uh, should all be measurable. Okay, this is not a specific definition. This is just sort of a suggestion to do something like this. I'm not sure if I've made myself clear. Well, the point is that uh, top UB uh, defines, uh, uh, let's say, the regular subsets of the real. So uh, I think that. If you come up with something uh, very general for uh, universal measurability, either you get the same as top UB or, or uh, otherwise you get something uh, weaker. 
uh, you are saying it cannot be uh, like orthogonal. Why? Well, I don't. I, I suspect it should not be orthogonal because if you assume, well, uh, I mean, it may be orthogonal in the context of non-large cardinals, but if you assume large cardinals, top U B exactly uh, pins the the regular subset, so those that can have any nice regularity property you may have in mind. So, for example, top U B would overlap with the determined sets. Mm -hmm. So you are saying that top U B is so maximal that you cannot hope for anything that sticks out of it. Could be, but then still the question is there. Uh, suppose you, instead of these many, many topological spaces, you mean you'll use many, many measure spaces. Do you arrive at the same class? I think this is, a, this is still an interesting class. Mm -hmm. An interesting question, yeah. You are right, it could be that I don't know. It could be it's, if it is slightly smaller. I think it's interesting. If it's the exact I same, think there is some work on this. I mean, it depends also on what you mean by measure spaces. But for example, if if they somehow are uh, products or uh, even more than that of uh, of uh, uh, I mean uh, of uh, random uh, measure of random forcing, then they you don't get uh, top U B. You get a much uh, weaker notion. Oh, I didn't know about this. So, so you mean that the class of measures you look at are just the arbitrary sized product measures of the of the two elements, and even more than that. So, arbitrary product measures, and then uh, even uh, some more uh, uh, some more uh, operations that uh, that. Uh... I see. I, I I find this very interesting. Still, this is not as general as you can go, but uh, this is very interesting. Could, could you send me a reference for this? I, I have. <laughs> I'm not so good at this, but I know that uh, I can say, tell you people that may give you better references. Okay, even that's very interesting because I, I haven't found any, anything similar to this. But uh, but still, I mean, uh, this is okay. So I'm, I'm not sure how restricted this class of measure spaces is. Maybe. <laughs> Not as general as it as it can be, but still, it is, this this could be very relevant. I would be happy to happy to to find this. Okay. All right. So, are there any more questions for Mata? Well, if not, let's uh, thank him again uh, for a very very nice talk. And um, thank you. So